little jump. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Both hands down to let the fourth rung up. There you go. My last wife would, would say, now, what is it that drives you into what you're doing? To serve my country, that is my objective. And if I can make a living out of it, fine. It, it's the satisfaction of uh, taking what we have and curiosity and turning it into new opportunities that, that really turns me on. The course objective was to take uh, Dr. Buzz Aldrin's plan in his latest book and turn it into numbers. That's what I asked my design team to figure out. So with this mission, our primary goal is to establish permanent bases on Mars. But on the way, we're going to use the Moon and Phobos as stepping stones. We're going to be starting off with some international moon bases. And then from there, we can move to putting a smaller base on Phobos, operating robotically some cranes and rovers on the surface, and then actually, once we get to about 2040, fully establishing and manning a base on Mars. In the next 25 years, we can do this. The moon bases are intended to test all the technologies that we need for the later missions that we're going to do. At the same time, we'll also be doing some testing on the Earth and Hawaii and other places to make sure that all her modules are ready for the Martian surface and in space. We'll have three bases at the moon. One at the far side, one at the near side, and the most interesting of them all, at look at the South Pole at Shackleton Crater. Each lunar base will be composed of three second generation exploration modules. It is at Shackleton Crater where we will produce um, rocket fuel from the water extracted from the icy regolith from the moon. We want to produce rocket fuel from the moon because bringing all the rocket fuel to go to Mars from Earth is extremely expensive due to our Earth's high gravity and atmosphere. I designed a cycler of sorts 10 years ago and it was the most complex thing. Nobody would ever build that. Big things rotating around. The cycler is a manned spacecraft designed for delivering uh, astronauts to Mars and Phobos safely and efficiently. Analogous to a shuttle bus on Earth, it will be orbiting the Sun and meeting Earth and Mars at regular intervals throughout the mission. The cycler vehicle will orbit in an S1L1 trajectory. This trajectory allows for a large vehicle to remain in orbit and for smaller taxi-like vehicles known as the human landers, to bring humans to and from the cycler. The S1L1 trajectory is a heliocentric orbit that uses gravity assists at both Earth and Mars to minimize the number of propulsive maneuvers necessary. This solution allows for a larger living space for the humans on their journey from Earth to Mars. Because the orbit opportunity exists each synodic period, but this is a two synodic period cycler, we will use two cycler vehicles to maximize the number of trips from Earth to Mars. An important consideration for long-duration, low-gravity human spaceflight is the time of flight for the crew. The S1L1 has a time of flight from Earth to Mars of only 138 to 183 days. This short duration allows for the crew's mental and physical health to be maintained. Cycler vehicles will also serve as communication satellites. Once both cycler vehicles are in orbit, we will be able to maintain continuous coverage even when Earth and Mars are in solar conjunction. To begin, a boost vehicle will be launched to low Earth orbit. After this, three human landers will be launched and, and docked separately with a boost vehicle. Then, this four vehicle assembly will be boosted out of Earth's orbit 
to meet with a cycler using a hyperbolic rendezvous. To get the crew from low Earth orbit to the cycler, we will need to perform a hyperbolic rendezvous. This is dangerous. If anything goes wrong, we could lose the crew. Because the hyperbolic rendezvous has never been done before, we will perform two tests using cargo to ensure everything goes as planned once the astronauts are ready to make their journey. Once they are docked, the astronauts can leave the human landers and go to the top section of the boost vehicle, which is uh, pressurized and habitable. Then they will have access to both the uh, habitation modules. The first cycler vehicle, Cycler A, will carry six astronauts to Phobos. These astronauts will be in charge of surface operations on Mars while we construct the colony. The second cycler vehicle, Cycler B, will come one synodic period later, and it will carry 18 astronauts. Six of these will go to replace the crew on Phobos. The other 12 will go to the surface of Mars and join the crew of six from Phobos. These will be the first men and women to ever step foot on another planet. From there, 18 astronauts will continue to come on each cycle. In order to meet the 280 kilowatt power demand, we will employ two ATK solar panels. Around Mars, the solar flux available is only 40% of the solar flux available around the Earth. These solar panels are circular and flexible. This design allows them to be very lightweight and to have very few storage volume. These flexible wings are 28 meters in diameter and are capable of folding up like a Japanese fan in order to fit inside a small fairing for launch. The first floor of the XM3 it houses the power systems, thermal systems, water systems and life support systems all necessary for crew survival. Uh, the second floor uh, contains like a lab space and a group habitat space, or group leisure space. On the third floor is the habitat's personal space. This contains area for each of the crew members to have uh, space to sleep or have individual leisure activities. The human lander, or hula, is what's going to be the capsule that contains the first six crew members on every mission. The general shape of the human lander is shown here, which is similar to an Orion capsule or a Hershey kiss. Inside the human lander, there'll be two rows of three seats each. And the astronauts leave the cycler and land on either Phobos or Mars. Either of these journeys will take approximately 1.3 days. Upon leaving the cycler, the human lander will approach Mars in a hyperbolic trajectory, such as this, where we will be performing an aero capture maneuver where we skim the atmosphere and then head out either to Phobos or back around for a direct entry at Mars. To enter Mars, we have a heat shield which is mechanically deployable. We will be deploying this in space upon leaving the cycler and this will take the blunt of the heat force and the deceleration maneuvers. Upon descent, this will decelerate us to a reasonable speed and then we will deploy a balut in order to decrease the speed even further. The high heating will be absorbed by the heat shield and the balut will do a lot of the deceleration in the final descent stage. Upon reaching a reasonable terminal velocity, a propulsion system will be ignited, the heat shield will be dropped, and the balloon will be cut. The terminal propulsion system will bring us down to a zero vertical velocity and cause a hover maneuver where we can move laterally if need be to increase the accuracy of landing. We will deploy landing gear and finally land directly on the Martian surface. On the Martian surface, the human lander will transform into a rover. The crane will pick up the human lander and place it onto a chassis. Once onto the separate chassis, the human lander will look like this. The human lander will then be able to travel up to 20 kilometers per hour and go up an incline of approximately 30 degrees. The main value of the Phobos base is that we're being able to eliminate the 24 minute time delay that can happen between Earth and Mars. So we can actually be operating rovers on the surface in a timely manner and that can really help the science and exploration that we're doing of the Martian surface. The Phobos base will be composed of three XM3s and two human landers. This will be the home to the crew of six. The base will be equipped with an artificial gravity module. The reason we're going to Mars is colonization. We're not just doing a flags and footprints approach like we did with the moon before in the Apollo program. No, this time we're going to stay. And that's the most important part of it. Back on the surface of Mars, the main colony is made up of nine XM connected XM3 modules. 
three in the center as the crew living quarters, two additional on the outside to serve as water processing storage, two other out here to serve as farming, and then one extra core module and another module to serve as the uh, medical bay. Together, these modules form the entirety of the, of the colony and will house at most a 54-person crew. The entire colony is also directly located underneath an inflatable uh, dome that is filled with Martian regolith, the dome providing the necessary radiation shielding for this mission. The XM3s will be powered by a buried uh, nuclear reactor. Even if it were possible for the colonists on Mars and Phobos to be able to produce 100% of their food, water, oxygen, and nitrogen, there are just some things that cannot be produced on these bodies. That's where the cargo lander, or Carla, comes in. Carla is the primary source for all resupply needs for the colonists on Mars and Phobos. Once in low Earth orbit, the chemical rocket engine will fire. The cargo vehicle will be using Hohmann transfers to get from low Earth orbit to the orbit at Mars. Once it arrives at Mars, it will then detach and leave the rest of the vehicle to enter into the Martian atmosphere. Upon entering into the Martian atmosphere, the shroud on the front end will also eject, exposing the hyper, uh, hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, or the HIAD. The HIAD's thermal protection system will protect the rest of the vehicle from the thermal loading and aerodynamic pressures upon entry and descent. Upon landing, it's up for the colonists to locate and retrieve the Carla capsule and bring it back to the main base. We will repurpose and reuse the the Carlo capsule in order to turn it into another auxiliary farming habitat. We'll put each one of these Carlo habitats around the main base in a semicircle formation in order to keep the regolith dome able to uh, house and intake more vehicles. The Mars Return Option, or MARIO, is a series of missions that is designed to bring a crew of up to six back to Earth from Phobos or Mars. And so we need to be able to return up to three crew members from Mars as part of our six-person return mission back to Earth. That is where the Mars Ascent Module, or the MAM, comes in. The MAM will be on top of its own rocket that will then bring the vehicle up to Phobos. From here, the crew of the MAM will dock with the human lander on Phobos and continue the journey back with the BA-330 and the Phobos return system with up to three of the crew from Phobos to give us our crew of six. Dr. Alden came to uh, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, to try out this new idea that he had of putting a spacecraft in orbit around the sun that would visit the Earth and Mars without stopping at Earth and Mars. But, you know, Probably millions of people would aspire to do what we are doing right now. So, you know, we feel incredibly honored, you know, to have the opportunity to work with him. He has a lot of brilliant ideas, and he's been doing a lot of incredible work in trying to put this vision together. He has, um, his goal is really to find the one unified vision, his unified space vision. We are not only working for a country or, you know, or, or a set of people, but we are actually working for humanity. And you can see that, you know, at his age of 85, I mean, he's uh, contributing significantly to the cause of human space flight. This is the, the biggest senior design course that Purdue has had, and I was very impressed with how they work together. Going to Mars is going to help us develop so many new technologies, just like when we went to the moon the first time. GPS, computing, all these other things came from that program, and we're trying to do the next technological push, pushing the boundaries of science and exploration to make amazing things happen. But most importantly, we need this to inspire the next generation. Our generation and the ones before it were inspired by Apollo, the space shuttle. But it's time to lay out the next vision and it's time to go to Mars. I think it's possible. It's, we have to decide that we want to do it. It's not a matter of being technically infeasible. It's a matter of having the will to do it. The reason we want to go to Mars, uh, actually it's for fundamental biological reasons. I think we need to change our perspective from just our ordinary you know, everyday issues and one way of changing that perspective is through the space program. When Apollo 8 went to the moon and orbited the moon, they didn't land, uh, and they read from Genesis, and uh, they inspired people about uh, how our Earth is so valuable. They took pictures of the Earth from the moon. They had the famous picture called Earthrise, and they realized that every human being that they knew were on that blue planet. 
and nowhere else. And I think that it's a, a point of view, it's a pers uh, it, the perspective uh, that we really do need to uh, guarantee the future of the human species. And uh, there are dangers out there. Are they immediate? We don't know. Everything we do, uh, there's a tremendous challenge. Uh, there are always people that says you cannot do it. And I think every uh, great achievement of humankind, it is the dreamers, it is the people that have passion in what they want to do. And so, so I, I, I think we have many students at Purdue, incredibly outstanding students, who have great dreams. And I wish them to, for them to continue with their dreams and, uh, and, and to have the impact that they hope that they can make for humankind. Whether we realize it or not, I hope we do. I hope we get the historians, the philosophers, the big thinkers to look at the progression of human history on Earth and to realize what a remarkable thing it will be to commit to humans permanently occupying somewhere else, not just visiting something local and then coming back.